Today we are chatting with Mary Denholm. Mary, welcome to the show. This, but before you introduce Hi. it, this is kind of exciting because you're kind of from <laughs> Bal- the Baltimore area. So there is a little bit of hometown yeah. uh, vibe here that we get to get into. Now I'll say hello <laughs> and you can say introduce yourself. <laughs> yes, thank you guys so much for having me. And I was born and raised in uh, Maryland. So yes, definitely that's that's where my roots are from. You guys must, might have lived near each other. I was going to say, so I grew up in a little town called Phoenix, Maryland. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but yeah, so you were in Sparks, Maryland, right? Correct. I grew up in Sparks. Uh, that's where my parents, uh, well, my mom still lives there to this day. And I owned a house actually in Moncton for about five years. Okay. So I drove through Phoenix all the time for work. All right. So you, she said Moncton. If anybody listens to our podcast at all, they know that Moncton, well, they don't know that Moncton has it, but the NCR trail that we talk about, the NCR marathon that we'll probably talk about on this podcast, uh, runs <laughs> right through Moncton. So I'm going to guess that you were able to jump on that trail anytime you wanted. I grew up running on that trail. And I, yeah, I mean, to this day, when I go home to visit, that's like the first place I could run. And I did the NCR trail marathon, actually, back, I want to say it was 2017. And I love that trail. Like, like I said, grew up running on that trail. My dad, when I was in high school, would like ride his bike with me as I ran that trail. So yes. I'm wondering as many times as I've run on that trail, I we've probably passed each other at some point. Probably not me passing you because you're pretty quick, but <laughs> you passing each other it, probably in opposite directions at some point on, on that trail. It seems like if you're in Baltimore, sooner or later, you're going to run on the NCR trail. Yeah, absolutely. So I always find, and then we'll stop talking about the NCR, but I always find... <laughs> It's like super monotonous. Like it, it is nice to go out there every once in a while, but I can't imagine running that trail every day. Like it's, it's just like though. you just it's the same thing for miles. Do you ever feel that way? Yeah, I do, and it's very flat. So yeah. I mean, if you're training for a flat marathon or a race, that's great. But if you're gonna do all your workouts there and you're doing a hilly race, like that's just not yeah. gonna help you. I did the dumbest thing ever. I trained for rim to rim on NCR marathon. The guy I was running with just said. <laughs> He said, just do 20 miles every week for the next, uh, you know, 20 mile run on the NCR every week uh, leading up to it. And I'm like, ah, okay. And he's like, you'll be able to do it. I got there. I had no strength in my, uh, what is it? Your glutes are in the back there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had no strength for climbing the, uh, <laughs> the uh, Grand Canyon. As someone who's done rim to rim and rim to rim to rim, I can't imagine the NCR trail being your training grounds for that. I mean, it, it doesn't get more different. <laughs> what did you use to, what did you do leading up to rim to rim? What was your training like in rim to rim to rim? Well, this was during like pandemic central. Uh, this was 2020 and then, so I did rim to rim in November, 2020. And then I did rim to rim to rim in May, 2021. And I was living in Flagstaff at the time. So I was able to go to the Grand Canyon and do like oh, wow. a 20 mile run, like, down, you know, South Kaibab, you know, up Bright Angel, like that loop, the cowboy yeah. loop, um, just like on a weekend with friends and like living there, I made a ton of trail running friends and like that made me the trail runner that I'm becoming yeah. you know, it's like a process. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was able to do that. And then I was living also at altitude, which really helps, you know, because with rim to rim to rim, like you're starting at six or seven thousand feet or eight thousand feet i think at the north rim going down losing about a mile and then going back up so that really benefited me and i have a ton of respect and awe for people who come from sea level and do that run because it's very very challenging what was crazy about it too is two things kind of surprised me i don't know if this surprised you especially if you're out there how long I was running along the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Like I thought you, it was, I thought it was going to be like a V, like I would run down, hop back up and start the ascent. And you, you, we did like seven miles across, I think, or how far was it from Bright Angel to Kaibab? I think it's more. Yeah. Oh, well, Bright Angel to Kaibab is probably about seven. But if, yeah. if you go like, if you do rim to rim, like north to south or south to north, yeah. um, I think it's like 13 on the bottom of the Grand Canyon. It's, and the other thing, long. yeah, and nobody, nobody tells you about that. <laughs> and the <laughs> other thing was when you're, when you're going up, you look up and you can see the edge of the canyon and mm-hmm. you run for an hour and you look up and it doesn't look any closer to you. 
because you're like yes. going back and forth. It, it, it messed with my head so much, but that's enough about me. Let's get it. <laughs> <Let's get into laughs> okay. So we kind of went off on a tangent there, but I'd love right. to go like way back to your beginning. So you even mentioned that your dad was biking alongside you for some of your runs. When did you start running? Was this like a childhood thing that you've always been doing or when did it all start? I mean, how far back do you want to go? Let's go all the way. <laughs> well, I think to the start of running, like when you knew, when you may have realized that running was something that was going to be part of your life. Sure. I mean, I, I, I asked that question just, you know, joking because my dad took me for a one mile run when I was two years old. Oh. Um, and my dad was a runner and he never raced. He, well, that's not true. He raced some 5Ks when I was in college because I was using them as like a training for my fall cross country season just over the summer, like fun beach 5Ks down at, you know, the ocean shore. Uh, at like Ocean City, Rehoboth, all of that. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, he was always a runner, very active person. Um, he actually passed in February. Um, it's, it's been a rough time. But, yeah, he was the one who technically introduced me to running at age two. <laughs> and, you know, I was always, like, fast for, like, field day events and elementary school and all of that. And... I did a mile fun run when I was, I think, eight, and it was at my high school. You ran down a hill, and then you came back up, and uh, I just, like, let everyone go on the downhill, and then I caught everyone on the uphill, and wow. I won. Whoa. And my mom was there for it, and it's a great picture of me, like, breaking the tape. They had a, a tape, and that moment, I was, I remember saying, I think I want to run, like, competitively. This feels good. This feels great. And so, you know, growing up in Maryland, I played lacrosse, of course, field hockey, you know, those standard middle school sports. And when I got to high school, I wanted to run cross country in the fall. And my high school only had a cross country team. They didn't have track. So I did run cross country all four years. And after that, I, I wasn't interested in running in college. I wasn't interested in the structure of any type of competitive program really I was very focused on skiing I my family split time actually between Maryland and Vermont so I grew up skiing my parents loved to ski that was their favorite activity and this is crazy but they would literally drive eight hours on a Friday like afternoon <laughs> to be able to ski Saturday Sunday in Vermont and then drive back Sunday to then go about a normal week that's nuts. Wow. I mean, I know. It, it, I mean, Vermont's nice and all. It's not like, you know, it's not like you're hitting Colorado, you know, powder and all that. But wait, so are you doing this drive with them every weekend? Yes. Oh, okay. yes. and this is pre, and so, this is pre iPad, pre movie. Like, unless you guys had like a two in one VCR TV that you brought home with it. We did. Uh, actually, <laughs> <laughs> my sister and I would be in the back. We had a, a suburban and then we had an excursion um so if, like it was a what is it chevy suburban and then Ford. eventually it became a yeah. ford excursion and we had you know the drop town like tv in there and the vcr under the um seat okay that makes and my it sister doable. and i would like, watch movies we would do our homework like and that's how we would spend our friday like as soon as we got off school we would go up and so because it became such a part of our lives my parents ended up having a condo up there and then I got really into competitive skiing as did my sister and we I ended up going to a ski academy in high school so I would like transfer up and the academy was the, your whole day was designed around skiing so like I would ski in the morning train like racing like gates and then go to school in the afternoon and I did that in high school because I wanted to race division one in college my goal was it was very skiing focused and I did ultimately ski race division one in college, and then I did run in college too, but the school I chose was St. Michael's College mm -hmm. in Vermont, and they are division one for skiing, division two for all other sports. And so I did run in college all four years, just cross country, but it was more like club level, I would describe, which was great because... I didn't come out of college like as burnt out, you know, and it's, it's funny because now that I'm 34, like 
I would love that structure of like a division one running program because like I very much live like that athlete lifestyle now, but I just, I wasn't there in college, like ready mentally yeah. for that. Well, you talked a little bit about your dad being a big influence in running and obviously he, he ran whether it was for um, exercise or he just enjoyed running. It didn't seem like he was competitive in races. Like, uh, like he might've been fast, but I'm saying it, it wasn't his goal. Where, where was your mom in all of this? Where, where's her, does she fit into running at all for you or is she just like more of a, a super fan of yours? Uh, she was active. Um, she was more into like walking and biking and things like that. And of course skiing. Um, but my dad was, was really into running for fitness and exercise and, you know, the impact that he had for just the importance of physical health, um, was really, that was the, probably the biggest impact that he had is he was a lawyer. He had a law firm and like, I remember I would wake up and he would be coming in, like he had just done his run. He had lifted weights or whatever exercises and he his day would start at like four in the morning just so he could get it done go to work all day and like he always got whatever it was he wanted to do that day from a physical fitness standpoint like he always balanced it like you make time for the things that matter right like he made time for that and I remember like he never missed a race of mine and my mom too um in high school like he would come in his suit from court, like flying across the beltway <laughs> to whatever race I had in like some field. And he'd be standing there like looking like he belonged in a courtroom, but like he's there, he made it. So yeah. And I mean, even with college, like, you know, they would drive to see my races and, you know, some, sometimes in college they couldn't because it was just like literally so far away. Um, but yeah, always there to support me. And I was super grateful. It sounds like, so you picked up running from your dad and I know that you are, or, or you were and are an attorney. So, uh, also followed him in those footsteps. Talk to us a little bit about, uh, becoming a lawyer and why you're not still practicing now. You know, in high school and college, you know, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I had thought about medicine. I come from actually a very medicine heavy family, lots of nurses. My grandfather was a doctor, but like literally everyone else is a nurse. My mom, my sister, my aunts, my grandmother, like very medical family. My dad was the only lawyer in the family. Um, And I always found appeal in the like legal profession just knowing more about like what our rights are, like how things work. And I like knowledge, like you have to like information and learning, perpetual learning, because that's what law is, is you're always learning. The law is constantly evolving and changing. And I like that. So, and I love research and I love writing. So in college, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I was majoring in Spanish and psychology And the good thing about law is there is no prerequisite. So I just decided to, you know, take the LSAT and, you know, I did well with that. So I applied to law school and that actually triggered my six year break from running. I did not run for six (laughs) years after, after college. I just went to law school and then I was working full time going to school at night after my first year. And like, there was just, there was not time in the day. And I know I've said, you make time for the things that matter, but like I was all in on law school. So I was not all in on running and I'm kind of that person that like, when I do something like I'm doing it. (laughs) So that was my focus. And then my first few years of being a lawyer, I also just, I just lost running, like honestly, and it didn't fit in my life and I forgot about it. And then one day I realized how out of shape I was. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean, I, I didn't like, I didn't choose to like follow his footsteps, if that makes sense. Like as far as law is concerned, I just really found my way to it. And it was a great career for me. I dedicated 10 years to it. That's where I met my now ex-husband was in law school. And um, we practiced for six years as lawyers and I was a trial attorney. So I did criminal defense work. And then I also did criminal prosecution. So I literally saw both sides, but I was a trial attorney. I found it exhausting and 
depressing and really hard to, because I'm someone who goes all in, I can't compartmentalize work. I can't leave work at work in that way. And what I was seeing was just the worst things happening to humans, right? Like rapes, murders, child abuse, sex abuse, like it really hurt me to see that and to know as a lawyer, there's nothing I can do to change what happened to someone. Yeah. And, you know, when you go to trial, like that person has to testify about what happened to them and it was terrible and they're reliving it. And then if the person's convicted who did it, they're going to jail for a very long time and jail's a terrible place. So I just felt like it was like depressing all around. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, I was like, I, I don't know. I've actually always wondered, like people that work in that profession, whether you're a police officer or in the in the court system, I've always wondered, like, what is your out, like outlook on life? Because I can't imagine it's easy to be positive when day to day you are just surrounded by really traumatic stuff. Like, I, I just don't see how you can look at even walking down the street, you know, see a stranger and give them the benefit of the doubt after you've, you know, been proven several like what you're seeing in your diet is this mayhem and chaos and crime and all that stuff how do you how do you not look at people with fresh eyes well you don't or i couldn't like you like i i couldn't remind myself that like enough that this isn't everyone but i literally started to see only evil and like think the worst of people and, you know, I'm a positive, optimistic person. I felt that slipping away and it just didn't feel in my nature to live in this profession anymore. And I also like, yes, I'm a competitive person, obviously, but you know, I don't want my work week to be just fighting all the time, yeah. which is like it's conflict all the time. You're fighting everyone and like, you know, as a prosecutor, you're fighting the defense attorney. Some, you're often fighting the judge in a respectful way. You're trying to convince the jury of, you know, something. Sometimes you're fighting your own victim who's like getting on the stand and like saying something different or like recanting and you know they're not being honest. And it's like, you're just like, I'm fighting everyone all day, every day. And this is exhausting. So long story short, my ex-husband and I were talking, we have been looking to a move like to a different area um, from Maryland. Like we loved the West Coast, um, loved Colorado, loved Arizona, loved California. And so we had been making some trips and we had always thought we would just like stay lawyers because that's our trade. But we had decided because we'd have to take another bar exam. Maryland doesn't have reciprocity with like anyone. <laughs> and so... Of course, <laughs> like, well, it's like, to make we're more not money totally that way. happy, <laughs> right? We we're like, well, we're not totally happy as lawyers. So like, if we're going to change our lives, let's like really change our lives. And when we thought about like what made us happy, it wasn't law anymore, honestly. And like, I am so glad that, you know, I became a lawyer because, you know, I have zero fear of public speaking. Um, there's so many skills that I've acquired in that time that I truly value and like I know how to research things and be helpful in that way in every career I've had like every job I've had since so there, you know it's not a wasted opportunity or experience um, I'm not throwing away a degree like I use it all the time still and we ended up becoming business owners and so the law degree really helped with that as well and we bought two juice and smoothie bars in San Diego and we're living there, owning, operating those for a while. And then we ended up getting a divorce and he wanted to keep them, which was fine. Um, and I had to find obviously a new job and that's what led to marketing. And because I did all of it as a small business owner for you know several years. So I got hired by a marketing agency. Um, and then that led to my current job, which is um, as a marketing coordinator for Rabbit, a run, running apparel brand uh, based in California. With Monica DeVries, who we've had, we've talked to. I think we've, I, I don't know if we've had it on the podcast. I, I think, think just alive. Alive on, on it. So we, I mean, I've watched that, the rabbit grow from its infancy. Um, we, we've gotten a chance to see it. It is really kind of impressive to watch a uh, business unfold, unfold in front of you. Um, 
and I, I remember seeing like the first first stuff coming out and you know just it, it's really taken off now it's so huge and like if you think about running no there's not anybody in running who's done it for more than a, a year that wouldn't know rabbit as a brand um so it's pretty interesting how long have you been with rabbit almost a year but longer in a way because i've run on their rabbit elite team for almost four years now wow. which is honestly what led to the job was you know, I've been on their team in their community for four years and they were starting a marketing team and asked if I was interested. And of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's all, yes. it's also interesting because they come from the retail space. They have, uh, they had a local running store, correct? And yes, so the, it's, a running company. it's not like they came out of this from left field and just decided they wanted to make running performance where, they, they saw what was lacking in the market and you come in and you, you obviously, if you're rabbit elite, you've worn their gear for quite a bit. So mm -hmm. did you wear it when you OTQ'd? Yes, I did. Um, I, my story with rabbit is actually my coach introduced me to it back in 2018. Um, and at that point I would have been like their brand ambassador level. And had I known, I just missed the window to like apply. I didn't, I didn't know about them. He gave me a code for a pair of shorts and I, I ordered <laughs> two pairs of shorts I still have to this day. And I tried them on and I was like, yes, these people understand. Like, you know, cause I, they really have managed to fit all different body types, which is amazing. And like, we're expanding even more like size options, which is awesome. Like shorts for everyone. Um, and I remember I put them on and I was like, these actually fit me because I'm tall. People don't know that I'm almost five, nine. And so like as a tall runner, things don't fit always for me <laughs> with other brands. And I remember when I tried it on, I was like, okay, I want to be affiliated with this brand in some way. And so by the next year, like the times I had hit, were for I, I hit for the rabbit elite so I applied for that um but yeah I mean I've I've worn their clothes since 2018 okay um so at what point so obviously in 2018 you've hired a coach but at what point um once you decided you were no longer going to practice law did you realize you wanted to go back and get competitive with running or was there overlap so that that would honestly be about 2015. Okay. Um, so I graduated college in 2009 and then 2015 is when I came back to running like in a competitive way. And honestly, for those six years, I did not run like at all. Like I was not running. I was doing some yoga, but like I remember when I first started back, I was like, <laughs> running hurts. Like, yeah. this is not a fun sport. <laughs> so like, I totally understand why people like hate running because it takes like weeks, months for it to like feel smooth again, right? Like when you're really shut down in that way. And so I decided I was gonna do a marathon. I had done one in college on a whim. Um, <laughs> I ran my first call. My first marathon was Vermont city marathon in 2006. Okay. And my college coach was like, why would you do that? Like, I don't even know if you've run longer than like 14 or 16 miles. Like you did not train for this thing. You're doing five K's and six K's. Like you're lucky you didn't get injured. What made you, what made you want to do that? Just like there was a marathon happening in Burlington, Vermont, which is where I went to college. And I was like, that would be fun. I feel like I can do it. Like, of course, like you can finish it. There was right. some walking involved. Like it was not pretty. I love, very, I like, love everybody's first. Uh, yeah. If they just jump in with, yeah, it, you, we could just do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever. Well, I mean, I didn't do another one for almost 10 years. So that tells yeah. you how it went. <laughs> fun. Did, so after um, you, after you finished it, were you like, I'm probably never doing one of those again? I mean, I was like, I, I wasn't like never say never, but I was just like bucket list. Yes. Yeah. Like there wasn't like an appeal to do it again. Um, and then in 2015, when I started running again, it's like post-college, like all the hype is over marathons, right? Mm -hmm. So for the most part, yeah. like, or at least that's, that's where I was operating. That's like the environment I was in is like, well, now you do like half or full marathons and like maybe there's some other races you do along the way, but 
you know, Instagram and social media wasn't as big then as it is now with like information and, you know, internet's constantly evolving. Right. But like, I just was like, I guess marathons is, is like what you do now. And I, and I knew I could take off a chunk of time from the one I had done before. So like I did train more properly for it and it went much better. And then, so I, I ran a 303 in 2015 and that's when like the OTQ seed was planted by some running friends of mine, not for 2016, cause that was too close, but it was yeah. like, you know, four years from now, if you can run a 303 in your first marathon back, like you can, you should aim for this. And I didn't even know what OTQ was. Like I didn't know <laughs> qualifying for the Olympic trials was something that like a non-professional runner could go after. I mean, I'm working as a lawyer right. and like, really? and then also I was like, wait, that's, 18, 19 minutes off my marathon, like 303 just literally felt like a max effort. Like I'm proud of that. I'm exhausted. Like, yeah, I'd like to break three hours in my next one, but like, could I really knock that much time off in four years? Like that seemed crazy to me, but like, yes, it did happen. Talk about 2015 being your kind of comeback to running and you're still a lawyer at that point. You're still living in Maryland at that point. Did and I'm just fascinated. And you had a psychology degree, so um, you might be fascinated by this yourself. But you, you're practicing law. It's a. It sounds like a toxic environment. You get back into running. Was running at least providing some space for you to have some positivity in your life, or at least get away from that mental stress of what was happening in the courtroom? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it. It was the way I started my morning. Like it. I had to be a morning runner to practice law and balance running. And I mean, I was getting up at like three and four in the morning, yeah. like kind of reminded me of my dad. <laughs> uh, it's like, if I don't do it in the morning, like sometimes I get stuck with like a jury and if they're deliberating, like I can't go for a run waiting to hear from them because they might have a question. And then it's like, you have to run back into the courtroom or, and like, you know, everyone comes back in, judge reads the question, the parties deliberate on like what the answer is going to be to this question, if you can answer it, or if there's a verdict, you know, it's like, you have to like be on standby with your phone, like waiting in the courthouse. So like, if, and I would get stuck sometimes late, like seven, nine o'clock at night. Uh, so if I didn't do it in the morning, it just didn't happen. And it was really a nice way to like center my day and have that peace and, and time to myself. And that's when I started training uh, consistently it was like 2015, my last few years of being a lawyer. How long did it take you to break three hours in the marathon after that first one? Longer than I wanted. <laughs> you uh, and Megan share that. Any, uh -huh. any time goal I set becomes like, and it's not just me, I feel like it's everyone, right? It becomes like this barrier. Mm -hmm. that like becomes honestly more mental than physical um like your fitness is there you're just not pulling it together on race day for whatever reason it took me I want to say 18 months like I was like oh the next one like I'm mm -hmm. going under you know and it's like no you're not <laughs> so that was September 2015 Lehigh Valley Marathon, great marathon up in Pennsylvania near you guys. That's I disagree I with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had, a, like you, had a, you had a positive experience. He had a bad it. race. There. No, I've raced there three times. Okay, I've done the, several bad I've done races. the Lehigh three times. There's a couple areas. You had, you had one there? I got one year. I got the, it was a year. It was 75 degrees at the start. Um, that one gravel hill you have to run up, you know where I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. Where, where that goes up uh, is not my favorite. It's near the end. Isn't it like 20 something? Mm, I can't no. remember where it is. That, that little loop that you go in and out of the park, like underneath. There's several areas where, yeah, yeah just it, uh, I lost mine. But yeah, I, I did it a couple times. And then I've also made it all the way to within reach of BQ and my hamstring pulled <laughs> and I had to finish the race running backwards. So, <laughs> what? Yeah. Oh my God. So, so Lehigh is not my favorite. <laughs> okay, well that's how I feel about grandmas. So, okay. you know, maybe we should switch. We maybe I'll do well at grandmas. Day. I'll yeah. go do grandmas. What? I'll do grandmas, and maybe that will be like I'll be like, what are you talking That'll about? That'll be your magical race, right? Yeah. So, but Lehigh, you uh, won. Yes, 
and I ran a 303 there. And my college race, um, I had run a 339. So that was like a huge chunk of time yeah. taken off. And, and I knew that was going to happen because, like I said, I, I hadn't trained right for the college one. Um, and there was some walking involved. Uh, but, yeah, so when I ran the 303, that's when a running friend of mine said, you know, you can qualify for the Olympic trials. And I remember being like, I'm going to break three hours first. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then we'll go from there. Because that is such a huge barrier for women. Like, you know, the three, it, it is not easy to break three. Um, and I, and I remember that journey drove me a little crazy because that was September, 2015. And I did it cause I wanted to do Boston the next year and it's the last chance race. Yeah. And so I get to Boston and like, I was ready for the goal, no question. And going into that race, I was sick. I had like a low grade fever and like I had chills and I just didn't feel good in the days leading up to it. But you know how Boston is, it's like you pay thousands of dollars mm-hmm. like between entry fee your airfare your hotel and it's like none of it's refundable so it's like you know we're going um, <laughs> you know it's like it's happening um what, and I what also year was this was this is 2016 it was a warmer year and like i remember sitting in athletes village just like being cold and like not feeling well and i did put a lot of pressure on myself for that race like looking back so it was just kind of like a number of things got to me and i actually ended up dnfing So I was a DNF at mile 15 and that was a new experience as to how long it takes to get to the finish on the shuttle. Uh You might as well just continue to run. Or walk. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And like it, it was like kind of, it was a medical issue. Like I was seeing some stars, things were like going black and I was honestly worried that I was going to like pass out and like, you know, hit my head or get trampled because Boston, there's so many people running the race. So like, I don't regret the DNF because I made the right call in the moment for like my safety. It wasn't like, this isn't going well, I give up. It was right. like, this could turn bad. Um, so yeah, that I, was- I rode a DNF van on. one time myself at uh, Steamtown. <laughs> and I have to say the DNF van is the saddest place on the planet. <laughs> It's, you, it's, it's just so zombies. Quiet. People are crying. <laughs> oh. It's like, yeah. it's like the worst place you can ever be. Um, I completely agree with you. So it's like, I'm a finish if I can finish. And that that's why, you know, grandma's ended up being a bad race for me, you know, several years later. But I was like, you're just going to finish. You're having a, a bad day. Like, you're just going to finish. Like, you're not having a medical issue. You're not injured. Like, just suck it up and, like, get to the finish. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that was Boston. I was a DNF. And then I did New York City that next fall. And I ran a 308. So now I'm moving backwards. I'm not getting closer to the three-hour barrier. New York's so tough. Yeah, that's a, it is tough. That's and, a tough course to try and go, I imagine, sub three for the first time. Yeah, and I was so in my head about it, too, because my 303 qualified me for their, like, sub-elite start. Oh, nice. And, like next to like molly huddle and i was just like i don't belong here like i was freaked out to be honest so i felt tired by the time the race started because i was like in my head about Mm -hmm. it and like this is all lessons learned and you know i've learned with time to just like what get rid of imposter syndrome just go relaxed into the race you're gonna run your best if you see it that way um, but I share this because we're not robots, like things get to us. And like, that absolutely was what got to me that day. Cause again, like ready for the goal training says you're there, but like now we're going backwards. Like this is it's, not good. It's also such a hard start. Cause you have to sit, I don't know what your experience was pre-race, but when I ran New York, I had to sit in the tent for hours before the race started. I had to get up at four in the morning to get over to Staten Island, you know, on their bus. It's just not the ideal setup for, I think, an amateur to go out and rock your best race. I don't know. Well, accurate, except I was in the sub elite start, so I didn't have that to contend with. So what you just described of sitting in the village and like you're huddled with people and it's cold or whatever, like I had that experience in Boston. Yeah, I had that experience in Boston, but it was warm. Um, And I completely agree with you. Like the majors where you're sitting out for a long period of time, like, definitely disadvantages you know the amateurs like like, as you described like you know the non-elites i will say um but when i was in new york (laughs) i was in the 
the elites. I was in like the sub elite. So like, I can't, I can't say that got to me because that's not accurate. Okay. Like what got to me was imposter syndrome and like stressing myself out too much um, for sure. Uh, so yeah, no, but I completely agree with you. The big city races where you're just sitting in a field waiting for hours, like that's really hard, really hard. But I believe it's the next marathon that gets you that yes. sub three. I do feel yes. like you need that and seesaw. Yeah. Marathoning's so it hard. Was, it is. And it's so funny because I didn't tell anyone. It was like secret race, right? Because like, mm-hmm. you know, like, I, start, I stopped having confidence in myself because of all these races that like I shared. I was doing this race. I was training with people. And I was like, I'm just not going to like tell people I'm doing this. And it was coastal Delaware down in, um, another one I didn't like, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I understand why you didn't like it. I don't think it's the fastest course and it ends with the half marathon. So like I was swerving Mm -hmm. around people and I didn't appreciate that when I'm like narrowly there anyway. Yeah. But I remember I squeaked under, it was two fifty nine like, 32 and the last few miles i was like if you if you break three like you never have to do this again we can just like stop yeah, running right. like <laughs> all will be achieved and then we're done because this is terrible this feels awful like why are you chasing this goal why is it meaningful like you know and of course i crossed the finish line and i was i was done like i was partially delirious and like needed some time to like recoup myself um, like not, I did not look good. You know how the, the quote is like, if you want to be inspired, like go to the end of a marathon and like watch people finish. Like what I looked like would scare people away from doing it. I was like, I was done. Blood <laughs> coming out of the ears. And then of course, like, yeah. And then of course, like 15 minutes later, I was like, I can do better. Uh-huh. Yeah. See, that's the sickness. How long, how long did it take you before you signed up for another marathon after that? Uh, I don't remember, but it was probably pretty quick. I was like, what am I doing in the fall? Uh, (laughs) And so I ended up doing NCR marathon. Um, I lived in Moncton. It was so close. I love that. I won't. Did it have the downhill start when you did it? Yes. So it started. But it ended on the NCR trail. Yes. That's what I love about the race. You come down from, uh, what's the name of that school? Old Fields. Old Fields. And Mm -hmm. you, so you have this start where you're probably going about a minute faster per mile than you should be. And then it hits the trail and the, the trail kind of slightly feels uphill for a little while. And then you turn around and it feels slightly downhill and there's no surprises. There's no hill. There's no anything. It's just grab mm-hmm. your pace and, and hang on. So, so you did that. Yeah, and it's great. What, what happened for you there? I ran 256 and you know, I, I was like, I feel like I should be, you know, just under 250 or right at 250. Like, you know, I, I, I still was like, I'm not making the progress that like I'd like. Um, and also plug their blankets at the end are awesome. Oh yeah. Um, do they still give those? Yeah, they do. And as a matter of fact, yeah. if you have the blanket, then you have a piece of my artwork because I, I originally did the, uh, oh, yeah. the logo. piece for that. Yeah. So I still have it. Then you know what? You have a little piece of, <laughs> of, of my artwork in your house. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I think they're going to change it soon, but yeah, that, that was it. So if you start having these feelings like you, like you should be running 250 or under 250, are you like, I need to change something or what do you, what do you do next? Yeah. I took a break from, from running competitively, like from racing. I was, this was when we were planning to move. Okay. So, um, we moved in 2018 to California. So that winter, I did mostly yoga and was just running easy, like very low mileage. Like I was running like 20, 30, 40 mile weeks, doing a ton of yoga. So June, I did a 10K out of nowhere. And I ran like, I want to say it was like 36, 30 mm. um, on like hardly any training, hardly any running. It was mostly yoga. And it was like a no pressure situation. Uh-huh. Um, Did it hurt? I was in, like were your lungs no. on fire? Anything? Nothing? No. Uh-huh. And I honestly think like, it, like, you know, I was doing enough running easy that there was like, 
cardiovascular fitness there and like some years of, of fitness mm-hmm. there. And then I was doing hot power yoga. And I think that that just really helped with like lung capacity and like my body just giving my body more of a, a break from the grind of running and marathoning and like being on this like hamster wheel of, of marathons. And I remember then I was in, it was down um, in like Georgetown. It was like the love something 10K, it's in June. And I was in an elite start. And that time I didn't feel pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, I just was like, this is a race distance that I don't do like ever. And I just let whatever come out. And I, I ran a very consistent race. And with that, I was like, okay, running is like, you know, coming around and, you know, doing more like cross training or, or like having a supplement to not be just running. Cause I was really like just running before, like obviously wasn't leading necessarily to success and like taking that pressure off was important. And so we moved that summer to California and I wasn't sure if I can fit in a marathon with my move. It's like such a drastic life changing thing to like sell a house, leave a career, buy other businesses, yeah. like but move, what's like also crazy. travel. Be- you're talking 2018 when this is happening, right? So you basically yeah. buy this juice and smoothie place or two places right before the restaurant industry gets hit really hard. Like, were you? Did you guys? I mean, 2019 was right when the everything was getting shut down. 2020. Did it? Did it? It, it didn't yeah. start in 19. So you had one year or so under your belt before all that happened well yeah but like it's actually a to-go place so oh. like mostly you were so set up in a good spot ended up being okay yeah so we ended up being okay like we had to shut down briefly like when things first were crazy and one of our locations was in a mall so like the mall shut down which was obviously upsetting yeah. to us because we could have stayed open um, and it was an outdoor mall in California, like not closed, like Towson yeah. Mall, like it's open. So it's like, why, you know? So, um, but we actually are, I'm still like in communication with my ex-husband, like coming off of the businesses, even to this day, but we had to shut down briefly, but we're able to reopen because we were a to-go place mm. and people if you're going to be in the restaurant industry, that was a really good one to actually be in because people started paying more attention to health and yeah. like wanting those healthy options. So our numbers, his numbers, technically at this point, are better post pandemic than they were pre pandemic. Oh, wow. Which is interesting. interesting. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Not for well, the pandemic industry, part. Well, that industry always does yeah. well in, in California because it's like San Diego is a temperate place. So it's not affected by as much seasonality anyway. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's good. I was just wondering if that was extra stress on top of the uh, training. I think moving done. in itself is enough moving, stress. Moving, buying a business. But yeah. so do you end up getting a marathon in in 2018? Yeah. So I was able to still run quite a bit, like more than I had been running that winter. So like that summer, like, cause I wasn't working as a lawyer and we were moving and we did like a month long road trip and I ran a lot like during our road trip across the country. Um, cause I was like, hopefully you only move once across the country. So like, let's take our time and enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, I was able to run quite a bit that summer and like do some workouts and, and things like that. And once we got settled in San Diego, I joined a running team out there, Prado racing team. So I started training with them, doing some races locally, and I ran a 117 half. Whoa. And, like, my PR had been 122. And, you know, that the 122 is what you need for OTQ back then, right? And I remember that was from 2015. Um, and I remember when I ran the 122, I was like, I have to do that again and hold that, like, to do this. And made it happen with time. Um, but like, I remember just thinking like, that's crazy. Like I just ran like six seventeen for 13.1 miles and it was like an all out effort. And like, really like, I'm going to, people think I can do that for like double the distance. Um, 
but like stayed open to the possibility of that happening. Um, and then, yeah, I did CIM in 2018 and ran a 248 there. And that race in particular was like, okay, I just had a seven or it was like seven minute PR. Yeah. And now I'm three minutes and some change away from the goal. Like I can see this happening much better. Like I always had that vision. I always felt like I could do it, but like now it's like I can taste it. And from there, the journey got crazy because I went to do grandma's in 2019. From the moment the race started, my marathon pace did not feel right. Like, can't really tell you why, but like, it just was, it was my pace during training and it was not on race day for whatever reason. And I remember at the 10 K I was like, man, I already feel it at the 10 K. I got 20 miles to go. And if that's where your head's at, like, yeah, that makes for a long day. day. Yeah. It makes for a really long yeah. day. So to your point about the shuttle, I remember I like got to mile 16 and I was already like off my marathon pace, but, and like, I was clearly not going to PR. And I remember like, I stopped for a second. Cause I, I had friends who were from Prado racing team who were there like for other people, like they came for the race and they were cheering for us and taking pictures. And they were like, do you want to ride back to the finish? Like with us? And I was like, no, I'm just going to like do this thing because like, you know, I don't want to DNF again. And like, you know, I'm going to get my finisher medal and like, I don't know, probably not come back to Duluth. So <laughs> I just like <laughs> make this happen. So I ended up meeting some women who also were going for OTQ and like had a bad day. And, you know, we all decided to finish together. And then we met a pack of women who were trying to break three hours. And then I was like, that's my goal for this race. I'm going to help these women break three hours. Cause I know how much of a time barrier that yeah. is and like how hard it is. So that's, what I did was like, I helped pace for breaking three. Um, and we came in at like two fifty eight something. I think, was that, you know, was that Indianapolis? No, this oh. is, uh, but was yeah. this one of, was this one of Mary's groups from live from perform that was there or just a sub? No, three? no, no. Okay. This was like before that it was okay. just like some women oh, who were okay. running together. And, like we asked them like, what's your goal? Like, you know, like, you know, we just like, we're having conversation yeah. on the course, um, which is not something I would do if I was like, focused racing right right um and they were like oh you know we're trying to break three hours and i was like well let me help you like i think i can sustain that pace um and so we did we ran 258 but obviously you know that's like 10 minutes off my pr yeah even further off of otq and so i kind of recouped from that and there wasn't a race that i could have like when you're in like an elite and like a pro like mindset like dnfing and then pivoting to do a different race makes sense sometimes mm -hmm. because it's like you have all that fitness for whatever reason today is not your day and why load a marathon on your body if you can like adjust and do a race like a month from now or six weeks yeah. from now right but you know so that's a different mindset than like like i know i can do a marathon no i can finish a marathon like you know that's a different but do you feel like mentality do you feel like DNFing? Like, I, I get it if you're like, okay, today's not my day. I can reload and hit another race and hit hit my time, hopefully, when conditions are better. But do you feel like that becomes almost addictive? And maybe, yes. like, trying to finish is going to be even harder because you're going to find a reason not to. Absolutely. And I think there are some runners who can have success with what I just described. I don't think I personally do because, and I don't think many people do because if you look, there's a lot of people who DNF a lot, like frequently. And it's like, it almost becomes an out when it gets hard. Mm -hmm. And like, you can have a bad mile and turn it around. You know, you can have a bad patch in the race and, and you overcome that or you're, you know, it's like, I never want, like I am a mental runner and I know that about myself. Like I have to work on mental strength and that's something that I help as a coach with those that I do coach. It's like, you, like you said, you can always find that back door. And I never want to have that back door like for myself where like when it gets hard, you're like, DNF isn't so terrible. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like, no, it actually is really terrible. And like, you don't want that to be a pattern for yourself. So, some pros and elites will do that. 
I didn't want to do that because I was like, you know, I want to finish. Like, and I'm not, wherever I end up, like, that's just what this day was. Like, that doesn't mean that my goal isn't happening. That doesn't mean, you know, my training didn't work. It's just like, today sucked. Like, (laughs) and I'm going to swallow my pride and like, whatever time is on the clock is whatever. And if people want to chatter, let them chatter. Like, I know in working with my coach that I was properly trained for this and like, it's all life lesson and I'm gonna be okay. Yeah. And so I finished, allowed myself to recover. And it was like a rat race to get into these. Cause like I was trying to go for trials right. at that time. And it was gun time, not chip time. So like all of us trying to go for it. Oh, I didn't even know that the, it's gun time. It was. And so talk hmm. about stressful. It's like, if I'm back from the start line and it takes me 20 seconds right. to cross the start, that's 20 seconds I got to make up out there. That's unfair. But that's the situation that those were the USATF standards. So we're all trying to get in these like pro and elite starts so that we can have every advantage possible. So I'm not trying to make up, I mean, 20 seconds, like that's not a ton, but like we're fighting that's a ton. seconds out there. Especially, especially knowing I already know the outcome of your next race. So this is even more cringeworthy. But so, yeah. So talk to us. You reload um, in October and you head to Twin Cities and what happens? So I chose Twin Cities as my race, which is not the easiest course. You gain several hundred feet of elevation in the last 10K. But I was like, I feel confident that this I can do it there. Like, you know, I, I was confident in my training and I just said, you know, you just prepare for the terrain that you're given. Like, you know, I would do my long runs and I would finish on hilly terrain. And so I was like, you know, I know what my marathon pace feels like, like I'm ready for it. I was in their elite start. Uh, so, you know, my time was like, I didn't have to like do math out there, like 20 seconds or whatever. It was like maybe a second, um, to start, to cross the start line. And I ran with, someone who's become a friend because of that race. Like we had a small group of women who were going for Olympic trials at that race. Cause it is a smaller race. Like, um, the elite field was smaller than like the other races. Like grandma's was huge. CIM was huge. And I shared, like, I don't know, 24, 25 miles with one woman in particular. At the end, it was just the two of us. Um, the group kind of dismantled. I think at most it was like five of us in this little pack. And we were on pace for like 243, I'm sorry. Yeah, 243 to 244, like the whole time, like very consistently hitting this. And I, wheels came off for me that last mile. Like Mm. I, I thought it was happening. Like, you know, and I crossed, I could feel my, you know, you like feel your body shutting down Mm -hmm. and like, you're slowing down and it's like, it's like you're literally you like start kind of like a delirium. You're just like, where's the finish? <laughs> like I look at the photos of myself and I'm like, <laughs> like, like my head's going back, you know, it's like, it's like, you're done. Yeah. And it's like, you're just, the last mile is going to be what it's going to be. Like I could not run any faster. Like I tried, I really tried. And when I crossed the finish, I didn't know what time I had run. Cause like, I couldn't even like see the clock. Like, I went up to someone and I was like, can you tell me what my time was? Like, look it up. And so they like looked up my, it was my name. And I was like, was I under 245? And they were like, no. <laughs> I was like, no. And they said it was 245, like 13 or 12, depending on gun chip time. Oh. And I was, I did drop an F-bomb. <laughs> like, I'm like, really? Like, I was right there. Like, that's, you know, a turn, you know, that's like a sneeze. Yeah. Um, but you know, yeah. So really I was more like at that point, I did not cry. I did not have a meltdown like the F-bomb happened, but it really, it was more like, I've done it. I'm there. Mm -hmm. Like if 12 seconds keeps me out of this race, then like, you know, it was worth it. I enjoyed the journey. It was fun, but, uh, it sucks because I know some people who miss by less, like, and couldn't go. And it, it sucks because that that's that's nothing. Yeah. You're there. Um, and I my main 
frustration was like, can I pull it together in time? Because the window closes early January. This is October. Like, yeah. is there time for me to achieve this goal? And so I was able to recover and bounce back and do CIM two months later. Wow. And that's when I did run 242 and qualify. And that was like a huge validation moment. And I had so many friends who did it at that race too. And it was like awesome for all of us to be there and like celebrate together. That's amazing. When you're towing the line at CIM, like what are you feeling and thinking? Cause like you have just like, obviously you know you can do it cause you were 13, 12 seconds off, whatever. But is there any part of you that's like doubting, like why am I doing this again? Or were you like, today is my day? I felt it was happening. It's, CIM was a race I had done before. I knew the course. I was confident in it. And I, by that point, had run so many, like, you know, Olympic trials or faster miles. Mm -hmm. And I really allowed myself to run where my body had settled in during training and not, like, you know, my coach was like, so, like, run your race like there will be a huge pack of people going for 244.30 right and he was like but what did we learn at the last race like you know i i went out with like a pack because it does make life easier but if that's not your pace where you've been settling in like first of all it doesn't leave a ton of room for error like not to bank time because that never works but like you know i wheels fall off for me the last mile which is common marathon's hard at the end but like, if your body's more efficient, like five seconds per mile faster or three seconds per mile faster, like let it run to its most efficient place. And so I actually went out like, and I let the terrain because it's rolling the first bit, like honestly dictate my pace. And I ended up ahead of the pack of women that came through at like 244 range. Um, Cause I ran 242 and like, that was my smoothest race. Like I was honestly like in a flow state in a way that like, I can't explain. And like each mile, just like, That's like I did not have a bad mile. Like mm. I didn't know it was possible to feel that way. Another thing that's missing from this, and we're talking about just performance, just lining up, doing the training, getting to the start line, but you're doing this while quitting careers, moving across the country, going through a divorce, all these mm external things that normally really can derail someone's training or, or at least their focus on, on, on their goal. How did you manage to it, like, cause you even said earlier when you were a lawyer, you couldn't compartmentalize your career from the rest of your life. How were you able to do that with running and get through and accomplish this during some, what I would call some high stress life stuff? Yeah. So you know, Twin Cities and CIM was during the disintegration of my marriage. And honestly, like my coach helped me so much. I'm so grateful to him. Um, there were a lot of runs missed, workouts aborted. Um, if you looked at my training cycle, kind of like the one I've had recently, honestly, it's like you would look at it on paper and be like, like, what? You know, and it. <laughs> take your training cycle, whatever you think it's going to look like, and just like crumple it up and restart multiple times. This is basically like what I went through, but I, I wasn't sharing what I was going through because it, you know, is private. And I did share eventually, like I've been going through a divorce. It's terrible. Um, but running was an outlet for me. And at many times it just felt trivial compared to what was going on in my personal life. Like, you know, a marathon, like the pain of a marathon doesn't compare to what I'm going through personally. And this is like, so a marathon doesn't go my way. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Like, I don't know, like what's going on with, you know, dealing with a ton of stress in my personal life, like in my relationship and, you know, that what's happening there is so much bigger than what's happening at a marathon. And it's like running just felt in some ways trivial, but I still cared about it. But like, oh, I didn't achieve this goal. Well, you know, this is a hobby. This is something that I enjoy. Obviously, I care about it a lot. But like that, not achieving that goal doesn't hurt nearly as bad as what's happening in my personal life. So in many ways, that removed pressure for me because it's like 
I'm doing this because I love it and because it's fun. And if I don't achieve this on this little timeline, it's going to happen eventually. Like I'm going to run these times eventually. I can see that. I know it's coming. It just might not happen before whatever date in January so I can run in this race in Atlanta. So yeah, I mean, I, I was fortunate that those that did know what I was going through really helped me and supported me um, because it was a really tough time. And then, you know, training for the Olympic trials, it, it didn't get better. It actually got worse because we separated early February. And so I was like mm. bouncing around and wasn't staying in a stable place for the three weeks leading up to the yeah, first race if, if people don't know that Olympic trials was in February. Uh, we'll just ask you a few more things because I don't want to keep you too long. But I do really want to hear about the trials race just because not only was that course insanely difficult, was the weather absolutely terrible, were you apparently going through really hard times, you crushed it. You ran a PR, you went in, I think, 180, ranked 189th, and you finished 51st. Yeah, I had a really good day. And, you know, I just credit that to, like, fitness over years, right? Like, um, you know, I had done all these back-to-back -back races, marathons to get there, and um, recovered well. Like, I took one at a time. Um, and I really trained for that terrain. Like I mapped out routes with a ton of elevation. Um, you know, I did like harder routes, honestly, than the Olympic oh, trials. Wow. Like my peak long run was 24 miles and it had 1400 feet of elevation. So like more than trials, trials was 1400 for 26. Um, and so like, you know, I did my marathon pace work on really hilly routes because I was like, I need to know what it feels like. Like there's no benefit to trying to run fast splits on a flat course and then you get on a hilly course and you have no idea how it's supposed to feel. Yeah. So, yeah. And I mean, I really went into that race just like this is the victory lap. And because of what was going on in my personal life, like I couldn't be nervous for that race because I was like, you know, I'm just happy to be here. And, you know, I've carried that fitness with me um, to where I am today. No question. Like I can I can say I'm in better shape than when I race trials and that feels awesome. And, you know, I never lost like focus during the pandemic. Like, you know, I did, obviously I wasn't racing. <laughs> no one was racing, <laughs> uh, but like, I just saw long-term, like, you know, where I want to go when races come back. And it's been a bumpy road the last year for me, but you know, we're, we're getting through, we're doing it. Um, but yeah, like I still, like, I know I'm in better shape than when I raced trials and that's, that's really exciting for me. So are we going back to going back to trial soon? Well, yeah. So I have to imagine now that you heard the news that the OTQ time has changed to two thirty seven. I imagine that you're going to be gunning for that and you are in the pro field for the Boston marathon is, yes. Is this new for you? Do you know what to expect? Well, to talk about the, the trial standard first, I'll, I'll yep. kind of break those up. Um, you know, I hoped they would keep it 245, but with the number of women who qualified last time, like realistically, I think we all knew it was going to drop. Um, you know, I was at 237 is obviously an aggressive time. Um, it's hard. And even if someone had run it before, like they got to do it again, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely hard, but I, I feel they still chose a time that's attainable for a lot of us. Like, and that includes women in the two forties, the two fifties, and even those just, you know, right around the you know, like low threes, because and I say that because like, if you look at my timeline, like the amount yeah. of time I chopped off in a four year period, like we're going to hear stories of women who are like low three hour marathoners who are going to do it, you know, within the next, what do we have? Like 18 months, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, so I really think it is attainable and I'm excited for those stories to come yeah, out. I like, actually I, I know they're going to happen. As someone who doesn't have to run <laughs> a 237, I actually thought it was good for the sport cuz I'm like look how many people they they set the goal for the to for the uh 245 uh OTQ and or 244 what, 240, two, 245 yeah, um uh OTQ and how many people reached it? who may not have, if they had set it for 250, I think that would have been the barrier. And so now I think we're going to still see a lot of women step up and 
just push themselves a little bit harder. I think it's that kind of like visualization thing. Like when you said you saw it, you knew it, you, that you were going to go after it. Um, it's daunting. I'm sure if you've run, if you're running a, you know, a 355 and you're like, geez, I thought maybe I could get down to a, you know, a, a 255, you mean? Yeah. 255. Yeah. 355 would be a huge <laughs> jump, <laughs> but like a, 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 my first marathon was a 339 and right. now, yeah. like, but like, don't I, I, want anyone out. Like, you know, it's like, that's what I've learned is like, anyone can like, I truly feel like so many people can do this because I'm someone who's worked really hard to get where I am. You know, I didn't just come out of college D one and like, OTQ yeah. on my first, like, that's amazing. Congrats to you. But like, I've had to fight to get where I am and like trust a long, long training cycles, years of work. Um, and I'm really proud of that. And that's I don't why trust, like, I don't trust I people say, who go right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't trust them. <laughs> well, that's why I say like, I honestly think there's going to be so many women who can do this. Like, you know, if it's a goal, just work towards it. And wherever you end up is amazing. Like, right. you know, if, you know, I'll be psyched, like, you know, obviously I would like to hit it sooner rather than later, wouldn't we all? Um, but, you know, I think it's gonna be a really cool day when I run, you know, if, if I run 239, that's an hour off my first marathon time, like that's a celebration. That'd be like, pretty cool. You yeah. know, and so like, that's cool. If that happens at Boston, awesome. Um, and, you know, for example, Boston for me, like, place is more important than time for that race, like historically anyway. Um, but like coming into it, yeah, like I want to, that's the shape I want to be in. And that's the shape that I'm confident I will be in, you know, in two and a half, whatever weeks from now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, like I'm, I'm excited for it. And as far as, you know, expectations, like, you know, what got me in that pro field is my performance at trials. Um, because for the open women, like you really need to be in the two thirties, like, you know, for, so like, there's obviously like the Des Lindens and the Sarah mm -hmm. Halls and like that, <laughs> like that, there's a kind of like two pro fields, if you will. Um, and then there's like, you know, the, the second pro field, which is like us elite women who have for the most part run well into the two thirties. Um, but you know, my PR is two forty one, and that's the reason it got me in is that was such a hard race and I performed well there. So, you know, that shows to me and everyone else like capability on, on a better course, you know? So I've, I'm very excited for the opportunity to race in that field and, you know, to see, you know, where I stack up, like, you know, to be in that field and in Boston is like, I just think like where I started, right? Like, mm -hmm my 339 Vermont city marathon in college or Lehigh 303. It's like, and now here's, here's where I've, I've gotten to. And I'm like, I'm very proud of that. And I'm very excited for it. And I'm, I'm very honored, you know, to be in that, in that field. What shoe will be on your feet at Boston? Nike. <laughs> Any specific? Um, so I actually did have to declare my shoes. Um, oh. cause they do like a whole inspection. Um, and we had to declare at trials too. I mean, they have like a whole setup where they like investigate your shoes to make sure all's good. Um, so they, they have standards and like, you can't race in every, like the only certain shoes, like they have like a list, um, that you can use the alpha fly. I'm going to say it wrong. I should, I should know this. The alpha fly. That's, I mean, right? you don't even have to do the rest yeah. of it. Alpha, alpha fly is, is fine. <laughs> But you, I think you actually did get the whole thing. Well, no, right. it, it, you have to. Okay, so the way they do it is technology, name, oh. version. So it would be Air Zoom, Alpha Fly, next, next percent. percent. Yeah. So complicated. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and I love the vapor percent. But yeah. what's interesting is I've been training a little bit in both. And, you know, at trials, they gave everyone the Alpha Fly yeah. like the day before. Yeah. And I was like, that goes against everything I've ever learned. Like uh -huh. I'm not doing something different on race day. And like, I went with the next percent cause I had trained with that so much as I've trained with both, like switching between the two, I've come to like the alpha fly more, but my initial reaction was, I don't <laughs> like this shoe. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's weird when you Changing first run in it, you're like, this is an odd sensation. Cause you bounce mm -hmm. and you're like, mm, I don't know if this is, is, is working for me. 
and then you do a couple runs and you're like, wait a second. And then the next thing you know, you start leaning forward and the shoe starts carrying you and popping and you're like, ah, oh, this isn't bad. And yeah, I'm guessing. And then when you go out it, you're like, man, I feel the earth. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, in a, like, can I get that back on my foot so I can like not feel the earth yeah. as heavily? As right. I and say. it's good for recovery too. Like I think afterwards. Yeah your legs aren't as beat up after you've run a hard workout in the alpha fly compared to some of the other shoes. Well, yeah, this definitely. is super exciting. We will be in Boston and we cannot yeah, wait. If you want bagels the day before you can hang out with us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cannot wait to cheer you on. And yeah, I think it's going to be an exciting day. The, the field of women that you are towing the line with is Insane. exceptional. Bonkers. And uh, you deserve to be on that line with all of them, and it's going to be just super fun to to watch it all unfold. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm very excited for it. Definitely. Awesome. All right, Mary, thank you so much. I'm sorry we took so much of your time today, but I really, really, really loved hearing your story because I can relate to a lot of it. I know. I felt like there was a lot of crossover yeah. for you. Um, so thank you for sharing and being so open with us today. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys so much for having me. This has been fun.